And um, uh, as an early stage investor, uh, you sometimes have the pleasure of introducing someone who develops an idea and delivers a phenomenon. I've known Block One CEO Brendan Blummer for many years, having been a seed investor in Block One. Under his vision and leadership, Block One helped EOS Network become the largest ICO to date at $4 billion. And EOS is currently the number four blockchain network by market value and is drawn to a very passionate developer community, which by the way is the secret in these public protocols. The summit audience uh, tends to comprise of crypto enthusiasts and policy mavens in roughly equal measure. Brendan will be addressing both as he helps us explore blockchain technology's impact on government, regulation, and digital commerce. Please help me welcome Brendan Blummer. Which side do they want me to sit on here? You sit there. for having us. Should we start? Yes. I thought someone was going to introduce you. Oh, I think they already did when we were backstage. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. Brendan, great to see you here today, and thank you for inviting me to do this fireside chat. It's pretty cold out. I was wondering where the fire is, but that's fine. Um, in simple terms, what is blockchain and why is it important today? Uh, sure. So really, um, uh, in a very simple way, a blockchain is just a secure way or a much more secure way to send and store uh, data. Um, and what that's ultimately leading to is an infrastructure rebuild of the Internet as we know it today. Um, if you think about it, when the Internet was initially designed, we were very um, you know, lax on regulations and allowed all the innovation to flourish, which was absolutely the right strategy. Um, but it was really being built on fundamentally insecure rails. Um, if the rails had been secure, we wouldn't need things like PayPal to sit between me and you when I transfer you money. It also means that a lot of centralized technology platforms are architected now in an inferior way because it was built under the assumption that all data transfer and storage was fundamentally insecure. Um, so in a very simple way, what, what we are working with is a new building block now that allows us to much more securely or confidently transfer and store data in a way that we know is reaching one, point A to point B uh, without being intercepted, without being decrypted. Um, and then through transparency, it creates effectively nearly an immutability-like dynamic because it's open sourcing the databases on the back end so that everyone can see all the types of activities that's going on in these databases. And what that means is that if there's a change to those databases or there's a change to how things are calculated, they can happen. People can make those changes, but everyone can see that they happened. So it's sort of like opening up the back end of your database and giving that degree of transparency into data sets that normally uh, there was, there was uh, uh, a wall obfuscated that transparency. So uh, I, I like to see the internet as really just leading as, uh, to a new infrastructure for digital transfer and storage, um, one that's fundamentally secure. Interesting. Thank you. Uh, what's the difference between blockchain and cryptocurrencies? Yeah, uh, a lot of people, it's a great question, and um, a lot, it's easy to get confused. Cryptocurrencies are really just a unit of account. Um, they're just like an Excel spreadsheet. You can use them to keep track of anything, which means that cryptocurrencies can be everything from utility tokens. We can have a currency that just represents our presence here at this conference today. Um, cryptocurrencies can be a security, right? You can have them securitize assets and you can put securities on these fundamentally new transferable or these uh, secure rails. Um, they can be commodities, they can be anything imaginable. So what uh, cryptocurrencies are really just a new unit of account that allows us to keep track of anything. 
Um, and blockchain is the underlying technology that enables that. that. So uh, as we got back, you know, blockchain is really just the, the databases behind everything that keep things fundamentally secure, and cryptocurrencies are just um, uh, uh, one way to leverage them. It's, a, it's, a, it's, it's our Excel spreadsheet for how we keep track of value and units on the blockchain. So blockchain has, I think, great implications for governments. Yep. And I know you're getting ready to come to Washington. Uh, Washington will be better for, to having you and your organization here. But what are some of the implications for governments of using blockchain? And can it be used? And why use blockchain for military affairs? Uh, great question. Um, so one of the big opportunities, what I keep saying is that um, Blockchains are going to turn governments more into development platforms. If you take a look at how governments are structured today, uh, most of the enforcement and execution of everything that it does, it's nearly outsourced. We execute or we outsource the um, enforcement of the entire financial system to private organizations like banks, etc., that then enforce policies. But once you take something like the US dollar and you put it on the blockchain, you allow the blockchain or the US dollar to be programmable itself. Right? And it turns the currency into a development platform that people can integrate with. Um, right now, when we um, build products and services, we, we do so around the constraints of the US dollar. And there's a lot of them. Right? Um, we can only make transfers every so often. They're expensive. They're slow. And so we build our, our products around those constraints. But in the future, once jurisdiction and tax law is coded very much into the dollar itself, businesses can actually build their tech stacks on top of government-like fiat currencies, right? Um, and this is going to drastically change enterprise and how enterprise interfaces directly with the government opposed to through third-party enforcement arms or traditional banking systems or traditional legal systems. It allows governments to extend jurisdiction and automate regulation at a level that's never been happened before. And sometimes we think automated regulation, well, that's scary. But the reality is, is by automating regulation, you start to digitize how things function. And it, it removes a lot of ambiguity for businesses on how it actually should work. All right? When there's real hard rules coded into the currency itself, it makes it a lot easier for people to be compliant. And it makes it a lot easier for people to build things right from the get-go that actually manage or are in line with what the government's looking to accomplish on behalf of, of, of the public, but also what the business is looking to do in terms of delivering innovation to the community or to, to the public as well. Military. How does it how yeah. does it impact the military and how do you see the military using blockchain to its advantage? Well, I think that fundamentally um, introducing secure rails of data transfer uh, fixes a lot of the national security issues that we have today here in America. Um, seemingly overnight in the last 10 years, we woke up and we realized that one of the biggest security threats for our country was Facebook, right? Um, now all of a sudden we've got immense amounts of data. Data is the new oil, um, and it's all floating around in ways that even the biggest companies in the world can't protect it. Right? You hear about it every week, some big company that we all rely on as part of our mainstream infrastructure to protect the most important data uh, you know, to ourselves, things that represent our identity. I always say identity is the most invaluable thing that you have that you don't actually own. It is everyone else's perception of you. Right? It's being spilled all over the place in ways that in, 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 any individual cannot control. If you look at DNS, it's fundamentally insecure right? domains. Well, I'm always worried that someone's going to hijack block one, not because of what we do, or block dot one, or some type of website. It's because DNS built on the existing rails of is fundamentally insecure, right? And so what it's going to do is start to close a lot of security loopholes um, that actually uh, that military and government need to worry about today. Um, and so when you get into fully identified social media networks where people can actually put their personal information on the blockchain in a way that the, the company or the platform that didn't that, that that actually enabled that functionality doesn't even have access to when you're giving your friends a private key to see your information but the actual blockchain it's run can't access your 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 personal details what it does is it closes a lot of those security loopholes that the government needs to worry about today um, that uh, uh, they wouldn't have to do so in a more secure world interesting thank you well, this is all interesting, but how far away is all this 
change going to happen? How, how long is it going to happen? And, and will, when, when it does happen, this new digital infrastructure, is it going to be felt by individuals? How will we feel it? Right. Um, this is a great question. I always talk a lot about kind of what this future world looks like when blockchain and tokenization takes over. And one of the big questions is always, well, why hasn't that happened yet? Um, there is very much a gap between what we know blockchain is capable of but the, and the underlying ability for existing protocols and existing um, blockchains to scale and meet the performance required to actually have mainstream adoption. But that's changing. So if you look at projects like EOS or any other types of things out there, um, we're starting to solve some of those issues. If you look at the first you know, blockchain, let's just say Bitcoin, right? Fundamentally transformative in how we will do everything going forward. But actually, a transfer takes an hour, right? Um, it, uh, uh, it's expensive. If you look at the dilution we pay uh, for, through new inflation on an annual basis, you're talking 100 50 or $100 per transaction. I'll, I'll switch to this. Um, you're talking 50 to $100 per transaction, and it can only process about three transactions a second for every person on the network. So huge scaling limitations with those types of, uh, the way that they were initially architected. As we move forward, we've now built blockchains which can scale up to 10,000s of transactions per second, nominal cost, one second confirmation times, but the next big stage is inter-blockchain communication, where you can have millions of blockchains seamlessly working on the back end that can scale it. And that's what's going to take to build something, to put every like, to put every piece of content, to put social media, Uber, Airbnb, all of these things on the blockchain. We've needed infrastructure to, to, that can scale. And that's happening this year. In terms of how uh, you know, consumers are going to be felt, What's happened is now that we have secure data transfer, we can re-architect virtually every business out there and we can start to align the beneficiaries of platforms with the actual user base, right? So the next version of Facebook, for example, it doesn't look like a private organization that harvests people's data and sells it, right? It leverages open source uh, code. If you look at open source code bases over the last decade, they've been the fastest growing types of, uh, of, of code bases out there but there hasn't really been a monetization model to it. It's all been, despite there not actually being any way to make money through open source code, historically, um, besides just con contributing as a hobby, um, blockchain is now putting a ring fence around open source communities and allowing communities to disrupt companies as we know them today. So the future of Facebook looks something like a, a, an actually distributed community where the blockchain is autonomously recognizing the value that's contributed through content, um, through content consumption. It emits tokens to these participants and the advertisers buy those tokens uh, in order to advertise on the platform. And, and what you ultimately do is you use an open source community to create a competitive organization um, that can disrupt traditional corporate structures. So my, 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 my belief is that as we move into mainstream products and you start to see uh, business models change um, and you start to see uh, uh, communities offer competitive products and services which drive more value back to the users opposed to a group of shareholders that don't add a lot of concrete value to the platform, that's when people are going to start to really feel it. When insurance companies come together where we're all mutually insuring each other and when I have a you know, an issue or a, a son that needs to get claimed for various types of things, I'm being judged by other people in similar circumstances on whether or not they should receive that medical treatment, opposed to a group of shareholders who are just designed to extract as much value as they possibly can by denying every claim that comes in. So you're going to see a big thesis of alignment um, through projects being governed by those that are actually affected by the decisions and aligning the actual finances of, of these networks with, va with real value creation. You mentioned disrupting corporate structure. Uh, you walk around Washington or any major city, there's a bank on every other block. What's the future of that real estate? And in 20 years, 10 years, 30 years, are we going to be going to the bank or will bank, will bank uh, real estate be obsolete? Um, that's a, a, a great question. In, uh, a bit of a controversial one as well. The I always say that retail banking, right, where we store our money, and it, it's actually native out of the bunk, uh, box functionality of blockchain, right? So um, retail banking will be massively impacted. 
As consumers, we have very little option on how we hold our value today. Right? We hold, most people don't have the, um, the, the balance sheets to apply for things like accredited investor status. And so pretty much our money is seconded to banks. Um, we put it in, in, um, in our deposits and then it all gets pooled up through a very hier hierarchical system and they invest uh, for us basically. And then they pay us interest. Now, as projects and uh, project uh, as projects move forward and they become tokenized, people are going to be able to put their, their their value in things that they know and understand. As you look into these decentralized communities, and I, I believe truly every product in the future will have a token component to it. And what will that do? If you take the, everyone knows those those thought leaders or those people that move into a clothing brand early on because it's cool and no one knows about it, but then when everyone moves in. After them, they say, oh, now it's, then they move on. That's going to become a career in the future because their ability to expose themselves financially to the success of those early stage projects through tokenization is going to be game changing. So right now, it's very difficult for people to put their money anywhere other than a bank. And it's even difficult to invest in products and services you love. Sometimes you might like a specific product, but if you want to put your value behind it, you have to first see, is it a publicly traded company? And if it is a publicly traded company, is it a conglomerate that holds many different things? I can't actually invest in something that's directly tied to the thing that I understand. And so what's going to change is money is going to slowly over time flow out of the banks and into direct possession of the people. And they're going to have the ability to put it in things that they understand and be evangelists for those projects so that they can impact their own value creation. Thank you. Um, I read a recently uh, an article in the New York Times, Sunday edition, February 24th. It had an opinion article titled, Can Bitcoin Save Venezuelans? It was written by Carlos Hernandez, an economist and contributor to the Caracas Chronicle. He says, and I'm quoting, in a collapsing economy, borderless money is more than a buzzword. What do you think of this? I think it's a great question, um, uh, and it's more related to maybe some of the shortfalls and sometimes of, of fiat currencies. Um, fiat currencies are hard to manage, um, and when governments are printing lots of, you can lead quickly lead to hyperinflation when you have a combination of the requirement to print lots of capital and the loss of faith that that capital can hold value. So you see mass depreciation and therefore inflation of a currency, and it can create a very destructive cycle. Um, and so there's naturally a flock towards other forms uh, or other ways to store value. Historically, our big hedge against you know, government currencies has always been gold, right? We rush to gold when there's, when there's uncertainty. And I actually always, a lot of people think that Bitcoin competes with fiat currency. I think it's actually uh, a competitor to gold. Um, it is a store of value. Um, it has inability to make micro payments, um, but it can be used in a lot of instances that gold can't because it allows me to transfer it a little bit more easily. I can actually be the custodian. Gold is very difficult to custodian yourselves and very difficult to transfer from one person to the other. So Bitcoin is sort of like gold um, that allows me to do global, pretty relatively quick transfers without counterparties involved in the whole process. So I think Bitcoin is a natural, um, uh, a natural place for a lot of, you know, uh, a, a lot of a lot of people in countries where they cannot depend on the value of their own internal, you know, fiat government currencies, um, it's becoming a real tool for them to escape those what would normally be catastrophic events if they were to hold all their value in uh, government denominated currencies. The USD, you know, a lot of people in, in America have a harder time understanding the value proposition of of Bitcoin. And that's because the USD is pretty good, right? Um, it's pretty stable. It's become the world you know, reserve currency. But that's a luxury that a lot of other countries just don't have. We've, re we've read recently, as yesterday, about um, universities in this country being hacked, uh, especially in their engineering and research uh, high science areas. And this is happening all over the world. What role do you think blockchain has in cybersecurity as, a, as, as relates to this very, very serious problem? Well, 
what if you take a look back at you know cryptography and its history um, we've been using cryptography from government to government communication for a long time it's the most secure way uh, you know secure way to send information someone has a private key over there and they can encrypt it and if someone intercepts it along the way um, there's not much that they can do with it and so what that what blockchain is doing is it's applying those highly led security principles to all data transfer so naturally there's going to be big impact what it does is it starts to we're moving from an era of trust me to you don't have to trust me right there is no more trust to be given from the, the, people just inherently are they're, they're not in a place where they're going to trust people anymore and so what we need to do is we need to create provably trustable uh, solutions so that people can start using them and know right that people don't have backdoor access to their data and so that push which is going to be a combination of an infrastructure rebuild and it's going to be a uh, uh, driven by consumers demand for trustless solutions will naturally start to fix those problems like when the internet was built on fundamentally insecure rails the issue wasn't as big of a deal because there wasn't enough people that could take advantage and exploit the system but now we live in a, a, a day and age where everyone is, a, you know, the new generation, they're all very computer literate. Um, nation states have huge amounts of teams. And so it's an arms race. It's literally every single large corporation versus every malicious person in the world out there. And so it's time for a complete rebuild on fundamentally secure rails that allow companies to achieve security without an endless arms race. Trust but verify. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> um, you're an entrepreneur. You've developed something uh, unique, uh, and you're successfully marketing it all over the world. You must be thinking, what's beyond blockchain? Is there? Do you do you think that there's some science, some uh, engineering that could be beyond what we have today in blockchain? Well, I think it's easy to listen to the idea that blockchain is secure data transfer and storage and say so what but actually it creates a domino effect that changes our entire world um, I always say we've been building with straw and hay and now we have cement and just because and so if you want to build skyscrapers we got to use cement right now they're leaky they're a little bit it's a little bit early stage we can see some of the flaws but what this technology is doing is it's leading to a social revolution. So when you start to look at the downstream effects of having secure data transfer, all of a sudden you realize that companies are defunct in their current structure because communities full of the, the general population combined with open source code, right, can actually create com more competitive organizations than traditional corporate structures. And so when you really get into it, and, and I'll tell you, I, I, every day I sit in this and I, I see a little bit further, right, 10 feet further in terms of how much this is going to impact everything. And I think even me, um, I'm at the very early stages of that revolution in terms of understanding it. It's sort of like when we had email, right, trying to imagine Facebook. Right? It's extraordinarily hard to to even think about how those extrapolated effects. It wasn't the exit. We tend to think, how is it going to affect existing businesses, right? We were, how is this going to impact media? But, but what often happens is it's the businesses that couldn't even exist or could never be thought of that emerge and change our entire social system and our society that tend to be the biggest impactors. And blockchain will have a whole host of those businesses as well. Brendan, would you like to take some questions from the audience? Sure. I mean, if there's any time, I don't know how much. I'm happy to answer anything. Anyone? All right. We'll just do one question because we're getting a timer thing on it. But uh, yeah, so maybe these two real quick and then we'll. So, so I think one of the biggest things you mentioned is. Uh... Sorry. Uh, so I think one of the biggest things you mentioned is scalability. Um, so I think block one is a certain, has a certain level of scalability. Is it. Is there a potential, I guess, as sort of blockchain grows and, and more people jump on, is there, I guess, potential for it to scale higher? Or does it ultimately end up on, you know, having to create another blockchain that, you know, let's say has different algorithms, can scale higher? Like, I'm just trying to think of the, in the concept in the concept of, and maybe it's, I'm not sure if it's the right concept, but in the concept of a computer where, you know, first, the first computer was the size of a, of a room, then it was half that size, then it was a quarter that size. Is that sort of the same, going to be the same um, evolution of blockchain? It, 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 yeah. Yeah, I understand. Yep. Um, so, 
blockchains do have some scaling limitations, and the uh, the scaling limitations for a specific blockchain are likely to main, to, to be there. But there's always going to be uh, lower performance in distributed systems. When you have uh, two systems across the world, we're bound by the data, you know, speed of speed of light data transfer around the, across the world and back. That's 250 milliseconds. It takes two blocks to reach finality. So you're talking one second transactions. Unless we fundamentally figure out how to transfer data faster, um, that's going to be those, those those limitations are going to exist. What you're going to see is platforms scale through having tons of blockchains on the back end, but that's going to be a seamless experience for the user. It doesn't matter actually which blockchain the data is stored as long as they can all communicate. The real key is about allowing functions to happen asynchronously, but all these blockchains still remaining deterministic. And uh, this is something that we've been working on very closely. I'm extremely uh, optimistic about the near-term viability of protocol-specific interoperability, meaning one EOSIO blockchain could speak to uh, millions of them and they could all work in concert. I am not optimistic about real inter-blockchain communication through various types, different types of technology. The integration will be very limited because blockchains are effectively governments, right? And so you have, when, you're, when you're trying to get EOS logic to get enforced on Ethereum, for example, there's some fundamental issues with that type of premise. It's sort of like saying, solving the problem, how do we enforce US jurisdiction in China? Right? And those types of limitations will always exist. Thank you. All righty, I think we're probably out of time, but thank you so much, Great I job. appreciate it. Yeah. Great job.